It has been a tough time, economically, certainly. But, of course, we're a society that depends in large measure on credit. As long as you got that plastic, you, who needs money? Well, of course, that's not quite how it works, or at least not quite how it should work. But even beyond that, of course, is the people, of course, who need credit the most are the ones who are least likely to get credit. Which brings us to Lee Kendrick, a credit expert. He's the founder of CreditUturn.com. That's C-R-E-D-I-T-U-T-U-R-N.com. CreditUturn.com. Uh, good evening, Lee. Good evening. Nice to have you with us uh, tonight. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, a particularly tough time uh, for people who uh, think that if only I had another credit card, I could uh, make it to the end of the month. You're exactly right, Jim. So what uh, exactly uh, uh, is the extent of the problem? How seriously uh, are we uh, uh, lacking in credit? And uh, to what extent is that a blessing in disguise? Because a lot of people, frankly, have more credit than they ought to have. Yes, you're exactly right. And, you know, and uh, I think early on in the very beginning of the uh, pandemic that uh, there was like this big concern that a lot of people would overextend themselves. Uh, and there certainly is a segment of the population that's been forced to do that, either because in several states, as you know, there are still a lot of people that still have not received the first drop of unemployment income. They tried and tried and tried to apply, and for whatever reason, they, they haven't received any benefits yet other than possibly like CARES Act money, although there's some of the populations waiting on that. But uh, interestingly enough, even though a few lenders have had to have massive write-downs uh, for the first quarter to hedge their risk and uh, due to mostly um, due to consumer requests for payment deferrals or forbearance programs, um, outside of that, it seems like um, most people are actually taking pretty decent care of their credit right now. I don't know if it's uh, that they're just the ones who are getting access to some of those unemployment benefits or maybe they're cashing out some 401ks, that sort of thing. There's actually been a little bit of a, of a decline in credit usage. And uh, year over year, April to April, bankruptcy filings were down 46 percent. Now that remains to be seen what's going to happen, uh, you know, after we actually come out of all this mess. But, uh, you know, the, the best way, I think, to avoid uh, making sure that you're just damaging your credit right now is just utilizing whatever cash you have on hand in the most responsible manner. And thankfully, I think that a lot of the entertainment options have disappeared for us to some degree, just because that uh, is obviously a money suck that a lot of people spend their cash out at uh, restaurants or going out to movies all the time, although it hurts those industries. So. We're being responsible in the face of this crisis. I, I'm amazed, if uh, if happy to hear that. I, I thought that uh, conspicuous excess consumption was an American right. Yeah, you, you know, I, and it's, I think that everybody still felt that same way. I know that retail online purchasing is way up, but obviously in-store shopping is down uh, just because you've got less people willing to go out or whenever they do go out, they're more in and out, they're more point-driven. Uh, there has been a little bit more in average spend in some areas, like obviously the cost of uh, groceries might be going up, and you see some people that are spending a little bit more in those areas because they're hoarding or they're going out and getting deep freezes and stocking up. And, you know, obviously we all know that we uh, couldn't find toilet paper for a month or so. So um, it, it's very uh, interesting dynamic, very interesting times. Uh, of course, uh, the, the age-old uh, dilemma of credit is that uh, the less you need it, the more you can get. And uh, exactly right. so uh, if, if someone right now, let's say they, they've, they've managed to get along, they were doing okay, they, they had a job, and uh, they probably spent more than they should have, they weren't saving much of anything, and then this comes along, and uh, maybe the job is gone, or maybe there was a two-income family, it's down to one income, but, but things are hurting. Uh, under those circumstances, it would seem like your chances of getting uh, that extra credit card uh, are slim to none. Yeah, that, that uh, part pretty much disappeared for a large segment of the population. So uh, credit card companies are probably the ones that actually um, like uh, doubled down. They just pulled back and they withdrew a lot of their uh, programs to the point that they were actually just being super aggressive on uh, either – uh, pausing people's credit privileges, canceling uh, their accounts, 
um, as well as definitely lowering their credit limits. So anybody that's exhibited any sort of risky behavior where their balances are suddenly increasing, they were basically uh, created uh, stop loss mechanisms in place to automatically identify that and to uh, restrict those privileges. However, the people with excellent credit just don't have as much of an issue. There is, There have been some complaints out there where people have had 750, 800 plus credit scores that haven't been able to get the rewards card that they've always been able to get in the past just because you've got some vendors, uh, credit card issuers that just aren't uh, providing uh, credit privileges right now. Now on the automotive side, um, a lot of auto lenders came out with some phenomenal programs, 0% offers, up to seven years, no payments for four to six months, that sort of thing. Those deals uh, didn't last very long because inventory, supply and demand uh, isn't able to keep up with the need to offer those programs. Um, there were some consumers that had a little bit of marginal credit that were getting approvals from lenders during that period of time, but your subprime lenders um, and subprime credit card vendors just aren't making uh, capital available to anybody with uh, anything at an average or below average credit score. You know, something I don't quite understand here, given what it would seem to me would be a demand for credit, that should be driving interest rates up. Instead, interest rates are really down low, and I don't understand why that is. Plus the fact, of course, that Uncle Sam is not only borrowing uh, like a drunken sailor, but more so than ever. I don't understand why we don't have interest rates that are way the heck up there. Why are our interest rates low? Well, um, you know, I'm not on the back end on some industry, so I don't know whether or not some automotive lenders, say per se, are getting some assistance behind the scenes and uh, getting a stimulus from the government to um, make more capital available. So that part I can't answer. I know that, like, the mortgage economy has always been a strange economy. It's very bond market driven, so it, it reacts more to the bond market uh, than it does to other areas of the economy. Um, I do think that they are trying to stimulate things. Uh, there are, even though interest rates are very low, again, there are a lot of programs that just aren't available or are more difficult to qualify for. So it's kind of like a smoke and mirrors game. They're still, hey, that we, you know, we live in the greatest country on earth, and and I'm a true patriot. I totally believe that we do. Uh, we're very fortunate to uh, live where we do. Um, however, just again, just because you got a 750 credit score does not mean that you're going to get that two and a quarter rate on that home loan because there are a lot of other factors that they're looking at right now. If somebody comes to you at uh, credituturn.com and uh, they say, uh, well, the situation I gave a moment ago, I'm moderate uh, income, I was doing all right, things are not going as well now, and uh, our income is down, and we could really use an extra credit card and our credit was okay before this, can you help them, or is it just uh, a tough luck, uh, see you around type of response? Well, no, uh, we can certainly help. Um, anything in the credit world is never really truly an overnight thing. Like, you just don't turn around and say, hey, I've had some credit issues, and now all of a sudden flip the switch, and you're just going to be able to actually qualify. However, we do have a great community of subscribers and users of our platform that also share uh, information, tips, uh, things that they stumbled across or that they were just able to obtain. Hey, I've got this score. I was able to qualify for this. So it's a little bit more um, like current uh, information there. Uh, one of the great things about our platform is that not only are we assisting you with identifying what's negative in your reports and letting you control that process through automation that automates uh, much of that process for you, um, it does also empower you in ways to start rebuilding credit and giving you ideas, ways that you can turn around and get from point A to point B quicker than you would if you just didn't have access to that information or that technology. one 866 jimbo our number, one 866 from our Credit Where Credit is Due department. Need some? 
<laughs> Good luck. one 560 jimbo We'll continue our discussion. Lee Kendrick is in the business of helping people out in this regard. So his uh, services uh, for at least uh, the next uh, 40-some minutes are uh, are free at one 560 jimbo And we'll be back in a moment. Lee Kendrick, our guest, he's a credit expert. He's the founder of Credit U-Turn. Dot com. Their website is that name, C-R-E-D-I-T-U-T-U-R-N.com. Uh, let's take a call from Paul in Fort Worth, Texas now. Good evening, Paul. Good evening, Jim. Thanks for taking the call, sir. Uh-huh. I want to ask uh, your guests, uh, why I, I have a, a over $7,000 debt, about $7,400, and uh, they, keep chart, they keep putting ta- the interest on it, and I'm not so quick to post my payment so I get tax on that I mean interest on that too and I got a credit card so I five percent. I was wondering if I should charge that amount to my credit card and be better off. All. all right. Any uh any thoughts of, of advice uh for our caller? So I was hearing that uh, you have a fair amount of debt and it's about a 5% interest rate, but I didn't quite catch what your exact question was there at the end. Yeah could you well, could you maybe, repeat that uh, please Paul? Yes, sir. They uh, keep charging my. They uh, put my interest on every night, but they're not so flat. They're not so quick to post my payments. So my payment is supposed to next day or something. Meanwhile, the interest keeps piling on at eight or eight quarter percent. I got a credit card for five percent. It's one of the to charge that amount to my credit card and be better off because I pay double. In other words, you're suggesting that you pay off one debt by uh, with a credit card. Is that what you're suggesting? Because the interest yes, rates sir. would be more favorable using the five percent on the credit card. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, if he if he leaves the 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 debt there as it is, it's eight percent plus interest. And if he uses the credit card, then he's paying five percent. So he's essentially he's still going to be in debt, but paying less interest. Uh, he he believes, according to this approach. Uh, your thoughts. Yeah, so, you know, you always need to make sure that you're uh, weighing and factoring out whether or not something is is much smarter from a fiscal aspect. Um, And, you know, financially, I I completely understand that. Uh, You need to look at, you also need to consider, will you need to utilize credit in the future much? uh, Or are you finally past that point in time and you're just never, ever going to need to use it? But if you are, if you ever think that you're going to, uh, you want to take into consideration your credit limits on your credit card because if you max out that credit card, I don't know uh, how much the balance is compared to the limit, but once you get over 30% of your credit limit as a balance, then you start to run into abusing your credit privileges with that credit card issuer, and not only would that potentially tank your credit scores, but you potentially could also lose your credit privileges with that credit card issuer, especially in our current economic times, because they're really taking a closer look at those things. So again, that's kind of one of those things that you just need to know, am I really going to need to utilize credit in the future? Because if you are, you might not want to utilize that approach. It might be better for you to tap into some savings or some sort of, um, you know, uh, look at uh, your investments and that sort of thing or cash on hand. All right. Good luck to you, Paul, as we go to Kathy in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm retired, and um, everything I have I own outright, and I tore up all my credit cards about 15 to 20 years ago, and I do have considerable amount of uh, money, but I've been applying for credit cards, and I cannot get one. You know what? It's uh, very easy to fall into that trap, and it's uh, um, it was exaggerated a few years back whenever all of a sudden if somebody didn't utilize credit for as little as two to three years, they're in danger of actually losing their credit score. And now all of a sudden you're back to like you're 18 years old, and you're having to get reestablished. There are some things that you can do. To, to work your way around that really quickly. Uh, one of the quickest paths to rebuilding uh, credit scores and a credit rating is to piggyback as an authorized user, like on another family member's card. Uh, you want to take a look at whether or not they are responsible. Uh, making, uh, you know, you want to piggyback on something that's got a high limit, that's got a low balance. Uh, they're not at risk of default. And uh, if you don't have access to that, 
there are also some online programs like uh, 5000creditcard.com that you can go to. You make a minimum purchase. It's not going to give you a Visa or MasterCard, but it will report to all three bureaus that you have a $5,000 credit limit. And then once that is on your credit reports, then you'll magically start to get offers and start to qualify for credit card offers because now you've got a credit score that's generated. So those are a couple things to look at. And you also need to pay attention to the mix of credit. So it's not just about whether or not you have credit card credit, but also do you have any installment credit. And there's a really interesting thing that came that uh, has come around over the last year or two where you can actually pay into a savings account. You'll pay a little bit of interest on it, like a, anywhere from 5 to 8 10%. On your money, but you can actually pay into a savings account, and they'll report those payments as if you're paying a loan. So that can also help you establish installment credit as well. Good luck to you, Kathy. Good luck to you as we go to Tim in Medford, Wisconsin. Hello, Tim. Hi, Jimbo. I only have one credit card. It's a Discover card, and every month when I get my statement, I always they always have that little uh, gauge on there that shows that shows me what my credit score is from the different credit reporting agencies. The one thing I've noticed though, and I wanted to see if your guest had insight to this, is that sometimes that will drop like 15 or 20 points, and it's always at the same point. Uh, with the way my pay schedule is at the place I work, sometimes in order to pay it off. I'll make uh, a small payment ahead of the the due date and then pay the balance off still before the due date, but making two payments on the on the on the on one statement, which still pays it off. Somehow that drops my score, and I w- wonder why that is. So there's an interesting thing that uh, uh, the credit scores have got tons of data, uh, uh, decades worth of data, billions of data points, pretty much every day. And uh, your credit score is actually really called a bankruptcy risk indicator score. And believe it or not, you're actually at more risk of filing bankruptcy if you have zero balances on all of your credit accounts, as opposed to somebody that's carrying between 1% to 10% and it is, act- is actively utilizing credit. If you're actively utilizing credit and uh, at those um, credit card recycle dates, whenever they're um, – reporting your balance information to the credit agencies, they see that you're actively utilizing credit, and so you actually have a slightly higher credit score than somebody with a zero balance. Your personal information could also be impacting your credit score. You need to understand that your credit scores are dynamic. They're constantly changing. Your credit scores are not actually provided by the credit agencies. It's actually calculated by FICO or calculated by Vantage Score, which is a credit agency owned scoring system we hope that that is uh, of some assistance and we've got more to come one 866 jimbo one 866 4626 is there credit amidst the pandemic well if you do things the right way and lee kendrick is a man who does them the right way credit expert founder of credit and uh, we'll continue with more calls at one 866 jimbo on the jimbo hannon show coming up in just a moment. Credit is mighty important for a lot of folks these days and mighty tough to get in some cases. Lee Kendrick is the founder of Credit U-Turn, C-R-E-D-I-T-U-T-U-R-N.com. Here is Ann in Willimatty, Connecticut. Hello, Ann. Hi. Good evening, Jim, and good evening to your guest, Mr. Kendrick. Um, I'm very happy and proud to say that my FICO score is at 800. It has been higher. It's been 804, 810. My question to your guest is, has he ever seen a credit score of 850, and does that really exist, or do the FICO people just have to have a cutoff and they thought 850 sounded good? Um, Actually, um, it's Close to 1% of the population that supposedly has a perfect credit score at any point in time. I don't think that 1% of the population knows that or actually sees it in those moments. Um, But I have seen that, um, I'm going to say, in my past life in automotive and mortgage world, about once every six months I would see somebody that would apply for credit that had a perfect credit score. And it's also interesting in the automotive world that they have an auto FICO score that actually goes up to a 900. So, yes, it is achievable. There you go. Aim for it. 
<laughs> Consider it a goal. All right. We can enter the Credit Olympics, perhaps. Uh, to uh, James in Riverside, New York. Good evening. Um, yeah, I'm 66 years old. I'm in the Million Mile Club. I've never had a car accident. And yet I pay the highest insurance of anybody I know. One of my friends has three DWIs in the last three years and pays half what I pay. Um, I don't own any credit cards, and I don't own a house. I do own my vehicle, but it's not new. It's used. Could you explain to me? And before you do, just remember what Albert Einstein said. If you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you probably don't understand it yourself. Well, I'm not fair enough. I, I have to ask you, if you've got this perfect driving record, James, uh, you need to shop around because somebody out there will offer you tremendously good rates. Either that or you're not telling us everything that uh, that applies to this story. So I'm telling really you everything. I don't own any credit cards. I'm constantly. Well, getting well, the, credit we'll get to the credit cards in a. We'll get, get, get to the credit cards in a moment, James. Right now, I'm just curious as to how you can have, have a a perfect credit. driving record and uh, and uh, and uh, still uh, have such horrendous insurance rates. Have you shopped around at all? We've all stayed for forty years. Well, no, I I, I, I had a question for you. Have you shopped around at all, James? I shop everywhere. Geico wants three times as much. Well, AARP there's something here that is, is strange times. because people with good driving records shouldn't have that much of a problem. However, insurance rates and driving records are not principally what Lee Kendrick is here for. Uh, you have a credit question for Mr. Kendrick? Actually, yeah, I, the credit, it question is, credit question is why is it that my credit is terrible? And I pay more insurance than anybody else. That's well, what, as we said, the insurance own. is a different issue entirely. But I think, Mr. Kendrick, uh, based on, on what you're telling us, of course, uh, you should have uh, uh, credit cards galore and uh, insurance at bargain basement rates, uh, Lee. So uh, actually, James, it's uh, very tied into uh, credit. A lot of credit agencies, as well as utility companies, uh, or sorry, but the insurance companies, as well as like utility companies, actually uh, monitor your credit rating, and they want to know what type of risk you are credit-wise because they want to know whether or not you're going to be able to pay your premiums to them in a timely manner. And then on top of it, there are nearly or right at 40 sub-agencies and data aggr aggregators that actually resell information to the credit agencies, which is predominantly where they get their information from. And one of those reports is called a clue report, and you might want to access that. You have the right to access any of those sub-agencies reports, just like you do Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Now, what was that, that term? It sounded like you said a clue report or a clue report. What is that? It, it's CLUE, C-L-U-E, CLUE. all capital letters. It's an acronym. Okay. I can't remember exactly what well, it is. Whatever, means. CLUE, as long as we know CLUE, we can find it. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you, you, need to, you need to get access to that. You need to see what's on it. You know, for all you know, James, you might be deceased on that report. You might have uh, inaccurate, you might have 32 speeding tickets. You might have 600 parking tickets or something on there. You never know. So access that report and take a look at it because those things all factor in to your insurance premiums as well as the area that you live to. So that could also factor into it because you might have been comparing to people that live outside of your area or drive different types of autos. But you need to have established good credit as well because if you don't, if you're not actively using, whenever I'm saying actively using, I'm never telling somebody to go out and just – go on a spending spree and like overspend and be fiscally irresponsible, just saying to have access to credit and use it occasionally just to keep an active credit score going. Uh -huh. So good luck to you on that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Samantha in Ventura, California. Good evening. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, I have a question. Our son, who's credit rating is not that great has requested for us to take us off as a, take take him off as an authorized user on a credit card that my husband and I have he's we on the card now and and he wants to be taken off of it correct um, our current credit rating is 818 um, we owe no outstanding debt month to month as we pay off our credit cards every month except for a mortgage of which we're a co-signer on for our daughter. It's 275000 which we could pay off uh, upon request. We have that in cash reserves. 
And he is under the impression, I'm not sure whether he's been told or not, but he is under the impression that we are ruining his credit by making him an authorized user on our credit card, which currently has a $25,000 max, and we've limited it to that because we have had prior um, fraud on our credit cards. Well, it, would this affect their son's credit rating, uh, Lee? Um, it should not, just as long as you're carrying uh, low balances in comparison to the limit. However, what I'm hearing in between here is that um, up until about seven or eight years ago, nine or ten years ago, back whenever the last economic meltdown that we had and a lot of mortgage lenders uh, fell like dominoes, is that they came along and they recognized that a lot of people were piggybacking on parents or even friends and sometimes were even purchasing what's called a trade line off of the Internet and piggybacking on a stranger's credit card. And those authorized users can inflate, those authorized user accounts can inflate somebody's credit score. And because of that, um, they will not allow you to qualify for a mortgage loan. Most mortgage lenders now, if they see an authorized user account, will want that account taken off of your credit report uh, so they can see what your score is without that support and without that assistance. So I don't know, maybe he's trying to qualify for a mortgage and he hasn't told you that, um, or maybe he's trying to apply for an auto loan and maybe some auto lender is requesting the same thing. Uh, however, that typically does not exist in the automotive lending arena. That's pretty much uh, exclusive to mortgage lending right now. Good luck to you, Samantha. one 866 jimbo and we'll be back in just a moment. Lee Kendrick, the founder of CreditUturn.com, is offering some credit tips at a difficult time for many people. And we go to uh, Eufaula, Alabama, where Russell is up tonight. Hi, Russell. Hi, how you doing? Enjoy your show. Thank you. I'm 63. I haven't had any credit for over a decade. I have substantial um, real estate I don't owe anyone anything. I don't owe anyone a dime. I, uh, when I purchase things, I just pay for it because I have the money. Mm -hmm. So when I check my credit score, it says I have none. I'm looking at it right now online at uh, TransUnion and Equifax. It says nothing. Well, I mean, you, you don't use it, and you haven't for, for, what, a decade? Yes. I guess you wouldn't. I mean, so, I mean are, are, you, are you surprised at that, Russell? I mean... Well, no, I thought that somebody was saying having no credit is having bad credit is, is, is what I've heard before. Uh, so, not necessarily. I mean, you tell us, uh, Lee. Uh, it, it, you know what? There's some truth to that statement because if you need access to credit and you don't have it at that moment, that's a bad thing. But I'm going to tell you that, you know, Russell, it's commendable that you're in the position that you're in right now and you've got the cash to pay for all of your necessities. If you absolutely don't need credit, it's not the end of the world. The only reason why I will always make sure that I maintain a credit rating, um, even whenever I don't actually need it myself, is to make sure that in the event that I need to help out a family member, they need somebody to co-sign for them or something like that uh, in order to get them started in life, I'm more than willing to be able to do that for them. And really, that's the in your situation, you might not need it. However, if you're planning on a bigger purchase, maybe you're looking to buy a bigger piece of property and you need to utilize credit at some point in time, you can still obtain credit with big enough down payments. So there's always a way to get around your exact situation. Yeah. Um, let me, that, that brings up a very interesting point that, that, uh, that Russell um, brings up and that you commented on, Lee, and that would be, to what extent is it important to, quote, establish credit. That is to say, I've heard it said that, uh, that young people should, if they have not established credit, they should buy something on time and then pay it off uh, just so that they can say, there, I've used credit. And, and then thereafter, of course, don't go hog wild and, and, and keep buying everything you see on credit, but, but establish something. I mean, Russell's got some resources, but let's say a young person has no resources. It'd be nice to have, uh, proof that, in fact, you can handle credit, would it not? Sure, exactly. And, you know, and that goes kind of back to another caller as well, is that, you know, if you have the capacity to be able to help out a child and get started uh, by adding them as an authorized user to a current existing credit card, the really interesting thing is, let's say you've had a 30-year-long American Express card, and you're able to add your 18-year-old child or 18-year-old grandson or granddaughter 
to your um, Amex account all of that previous payment history, that 30 years with the aged credit and that credit limit and that balance, all reports on their credit report within 20 to 30 days after you add them as an authorized user. And it's, it's a powerful thing to be able to get them started without them having to go buy something that they don't need. As far as establishing credit on their own, buy what you need and establish credit for those things. Don't just go out and, and frivolously buy something that you don't need um, or, or that you won't use. You know, if you'll use it in some way, yes, you, you know, there's nothing wrong with going ahead and getting started yourself. All right, good luck to you, Russell. And uh, Debbie in Harwick, Pennsylvania is next. Hey, thanks, Jimbo and, and Lee. Um, here's my situation. I have a three-year lease on a car, and I'm getting ready to turn it in. Um, now, when, when I leased it originally, it was my daughter and I. And uh, so that was back in 2017, three-year lease. Uh, the car is in great shape. Unfortunately, um, two years ago, my daughter passed away from cancer. Oh, wow. And so when we leased that car, it was with both of our, you know, credit histories and both of our incomes. Now, I have been able to maintain um, paying for, you know, the monthly the monthly installment, the insurance, and everything else that I have. But I'm concerned that when I go to turn in the car, uh, um, there may be some things associated with my daughter's death. Um, I haven't had any, like, notices or anything lately, but I, there might be a couple of bills out there that I've either ignored or haven't uh, paid that might have a, a, a negative effect on my credit history. And I really, I, we've dealt with this car company for a long time because there were previous years where I also helped her obtain a car. Um, and I'm wondering whether or not that will affect me being able to purchase or lease another car with them. So you're, so have you uh, co-signed with her on other debts outside of the auto loan? Is that what you were referencing? Because it sounded to me like you're not sure whether or not there are other things that were pending from her estate. And, and by the way, I hate to hear that you had to go through that situation. It's never a good thing to lose a loved one. So uh, certainly our sympathy goes out to you there. But uh, just tell us a little bit more about that. Well, <clears throat> no, other than that, um, she really, she really left no debts, and okay. like I said, I've, I've, I've pretty much, I've kept up everything, you know, since she's passed, um, and I, I don't have a lot of income, but, but I'm maintaining and paying, you know, all of my bills. I'm, I'm hoping my car company will work with me, uh, and I heard you talk about car company. Uh, you know, policies may be extending and, you know, understanding. And yeah, I, it sounds I, I, it, I really don't think that you're going to have any issues based upon what you're telling us as far as uh, that you've been making timely payments and you've been doing everything uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, I really don't think that you're going to have any issues. And if she did have something like she had a medical collection or something you didn't know, that doesn't impact you in any way unless you also held joint responsibility on those items. So you, you shouldn't face any repercussions at all. All right. Good luck. And uh, we'll be back with more calls in just a moment. Back to Jimbo Hannon Show at one 560 jimbo one 866 Lee Kendrick, our guest from credituturn.com. We have a call from Mike who calls in from uh, Brazil. Is that right, Mike? Yes, sir. I uh, tried calling the other week, but my Wi-Fi uh, pooped out on me, basically. Well, uh, we're glad and, that you've, uh, uh, you've made it through. Uh, uh, let me ask you, uh, before yeah, you get to your question, you. if I could ask you how the how the pandemic is is happening down there, because I understand Brazil's been pretty hard hit. I had it. It's the flu. Let's not make a big deal about it. Bill, Bill Gates predicted it back in 2015 on April 3rd. 
and I decided to leave May 7, 2020. Well, but, all right. So anyway, what, what's your question? Along, I want to talk to the credit guy. You he are. impressed me, and, I, and I'm 62 years of age, and I've been doing what he's been doing for about 30 years. Okay? And um, especially with the piggybacking. And uh, there is an easier way for the kid, because I'm also setting up a program with trade lines myself, my personal trade line. Uh-huh. Any, and what, what would that be? From, uh, well, I've been doing that for a while, but then when I was on LinkedIn, I noticed that there were a lot of parents that were co-signing for student loans. It's a kiss mm-hmm. of death. Uh-huh. And I'm very well versed in that, on, and I know how to zero them out and total forgiveness. But the problem is, if you're in default on your student loan when you're ready to retire, whether it's Johnny or Susie or mom or dad or Uncle Bill, they're not going to get their Social Security. So I came up with a better way. And, you know, my, my youngest trade line's five years old. I grabbed that before I left the U.S. Well, now, wait a minute. And if you have credit me- problems, that doesn't affect you receiving Social Security, as far as I know, does it? No. If you're in default on your student loan, please look it up. At the time you're going to collect Social Security, whether you're the primary or the co-signer, hmm. you're not going to get your Social Security. Well, let's ask. I have to ask Lee Kendrick about that. I had not heard that before. Is that correct? You know, actually, I, I really can't uh, answer that one either, um, you know, just because that's something I've never, ever come across in my demographic. For the most part, I'm not dealing with people coming to me uh, for my services for those last 30 years in uh uh, wanting to improve their credit that have ever made that type of statement. I'm not doubting that that doesn't exist in the language of uh, student loans um, as far as like debt obligations go. And it could vary based upon whether or not those are federal or private student loans. Um, so, but, uh, you know, I really can't answer that one entirely. Well, uh, apparently there was a Debt Collection Improvement Act of 1996, which the government set a limit on how much of your Social Security benefits the government can garnish to collect on student loan debt. So apparently you lose some of that. So uh, not uh, thrilling uh, information. Let's see if we can get a quick call from Rita in Dallas. Hello, Rita. Hi. I have a question. Uh Uh-huh. Now, my daughter uh, is retired and has excellent credit. But because I'm older and I don't get out much, I have her as an authorized user on my credit card, and it has her name on it with my number, but she orders things for me online, and she also goes out and shopping for me. All right. Well, now, we, I, I was not sure just how much we could get on here. Uh, uh, can Lee Kendry, could you stay into the next hour? Sure. That would be great. All right, then, Rita, you stay online, and Lee uh, will be back after we pause for the news, and we will uh, get into uh, the uh, question that you have about your daughter. Again, Lee Kendrick is founder of CreditUturn.com. And I'm Jim Bohannon. We come to you weeknights here at Westwood One. We've been talking with a credit expert, Lee Kendrick. He has founded the company CreditUturn.com. That's C-R-E-D-I-T-U. T-U-R-N dot com. And as uh, the previous hour ended, we uh, had uh, gotten a call from Rita in Dallas. So why don't we start with that call, and uh, that'll give her a chance to explain her circumstances and uh, let Lee Kendrick uh, uh, give you a response. So uh, go right ahead, Rita. Okay. Uh, My daughter and I lived together. She's a retired educator from the state of Texas. But because of my mobility issues, I don't get out a lot. She does a lot of my shopping, but I made, and she, we have both have excellent, excellent, excellent credit, and we both have our own credit cards, but I made her an authorized user on my card and got a card for her with her name and my account, so when she goes out, say, to shop, she doesn't appear to forge by a signature because she's signing her own name all of the the accounts has her name on it with my account number, and we felt that this was a better way to do this. So what do you think about that? No, that's absolutely fine. I mean, it's uh, really smart, and, you know, that you're just going the extra mile. It's not a requirement, by the way, because pretty much anymore, whenever she's going to a store, they're just swiping the card or using the chip reader, and it's going in there. So technically, she's probably not ever signing 
a slip unless you go to a restaurant and there's like a printed copy or something. But, uh, you know, you're, you're doing a great job there. So um, uh, I, I totally get that. My, my uh, grandmother would have done the same thing. So smart move. All right, very good. Uh, are there other little, uh, shall we say, tricks of the uh, of the trade that uh, that might be of, of interest to people that they're looking to improve uh, credit either for themselves or for a child, for example? So a uh, great way to improve your credit, obviously, is you, you just need to make sure that you access credit monitoring service and analyze your reports or utilize a service like ours that automates that process and does all that dirty work for you and that prepares your disputes and submits your disputes for you. But you need to look at that. And it's not just credit information that you need to look at. You need to look at personal information, too, because you might have great credit, uh, above average, great or even excellent credit. And just by having personal information like names and addresses and socials and dates of birth, that might not be perfectly matching your current situation might be obsolete. Uh, and you might even get a surprise. You might see just like some crazy spellings of your name and you might see some stuff that actually indicates uh, synthetic identity theft. And so with that concern, a lot of credit agencies will actually penalize your scores a little bit if your personal identity is not matching perfectly across all three bureaus. So you definitely want to clean that up. And then outside of it, uh, uh, authorized user accounts are great for younger people or people that have had past credit problems. If you've got a family member that will help you, uh, credit unions uh, tend to have a little bit more aggressive or progressive lending policies. Uh, they're chartered a little bit differently from banks. Uh, so, you know, those are great places to also establish a banking relationship with uh, because you're not just a number there. There's still a little bit of an older school lending there. Uh, it's still modernized in many ways, but definitely uh, make sure that you're utilizing a credit union uh, relationship in addition to any other relationships that you have. And then there are also some self-savings loan accounts where you can pay into a savings account. Uh, they'll deduct a small portion of interest uh, for them providing that service, but they'll actually report your payments that you're paying in regularly. Uh, into that savings account as being credit that you're establishing. And then you can do the same thing with some credit card programs out there like 5000creditcard.com or 2500creditcard.com as well as others. Let's go to Ray in Enterprise, Alabama next on The Bohannon Show. Good evening, Ray. Hey, Jimbo. Thanks for taking my call. Yes, sir. Um, my question is, I'm about to come out of bankruptcy here within the next six months, I hope. And I was wondering, in your opinion, what would be the best way for me to start rebuilding my credit after coming out of bankruptcy? Okay. So whatever you're talking about coming out of bankruptcy, are you on a Chapter 13 right now? Yes. Okay. All right. So one of the first things I definitely recommend is, is have a conversation with either your attorney or the trustee in some way just to make sure that you actually get discharged. Believe it or not, there's a uh, part of uh, Chapter 13 that's very little known that sometimes that they don't receive that discharge at the end. And that'll be really important to your next lenders uh, to make sure that they're not going to get caught up in that. And they actually want to see that verbiage on your credit report. Uh, the other thing is, is that there might be something inaccurate or incomplete or unverifiable about your bankruptcy itself that believe it or not, you might currently have the ability to challenge and potentially either get that fixed so it's updated and corrected or potentially deleted from your credit report so it's not even hanging over top of your head. And I think it's very important for you and everybody else that's listening right now to hear that because this is very powerful. So like in some states, uh, just as a, for instance in Kentucky, uh, the uh, bankruptcy court used to be in an entirely different city, different phone number, different address. Well, anybody that files a bankruptcy in the state of Kentucky right now uh, in the Eastern District of Kentucky usually shows uh, that old information on the credit report as opposed to the modern, newer location, new address. And because of that, there's part of the Fair Credit Reporting Act that says that it not only has to be accurate and complete, but it also has to be verifiable. And if it's absent any of those three things in a 100% capacity, then you have the right to challenge that and potentially get it deleted or, or updated. So don't, don't just think about the rebuilding part. I want you to think about what you could do to currently challenge 
your current situation. Now, as far as rebuilding, uh, you definitely, um, you know, there are going to be some creditors that aren't going to extend credit to you until it's discharged because of Chapter 13, you're actually technically not permitted to go out and access um, and open any new credit lines while you're currently in that undischarged state. Uh, so you need it. So if you do want to obtain credit during the interim and you're not discharged yet, you technically have to get the bankruptcy trustee's permission to enter into any new debt obligations. Good luck to you, Ray. Let's talk to uh, Ron in Charleston, West Virginia. Hi, Ron. Hey, how are you? Fine. Um, my question is, my mother, um, she opened a Lowe's charge account uh, probably two or three years ago and had me as an authorized user only. And I've never signed anything for Lowe's, but I remodeled her kitchen. That's why I was put on there so I could get stuff to do her kitchen. Now I've actually got my own Lowe's card, and she's going to put my sister on as an authorized user, too. And the problem is they've attached my credit somehow. It shows her credit card. And I don't want to have that attached anymore because my sister is bad about not paying. And I don't want it to dim my credit. Is there a way that I can get myself disconnected from her? Yes, you can, you can always have yourself removed as an authorized user. Either your mother can make that request and or you can also file a dispute and say, this is not my account and I want to be, you know, I don't want this recording any longer. It's easier to have your mother go ahead and to... Um, remove you as an authorized user. Now, to remove that history from your credit report, I want you to understand, I don't know the rest of your credit history, the age, the width, the depth, the mix of credit that you have and your balances compared to your limits, but you might experience a, a, a score drop whenever you do um, cancel out those credit privileges there because now all of a sudden you're not utilizing active credit on that account any longer. Uh, so you just need to be aware of that. Now, as far as the other part of your statement, I'm really curious as to I don't see how um, your sister's uh, payment history of any of her accounts, any other accounts, or even that Lowe's account would impact your credit rating at all because um, your uh, unless your mother is relying on her to make those payments, that's the only way that that could. And, and if that's the case, uh, it could actually negatively impact your mother's credit as well. That help, uh, Ron? I usually make the payment, you know, whenever we charge anything. It's like whenever we did her kitchen, I told her I would pay for her kitchen remodel, but to use her card to get the 5%. And I would put it on my card or my, you know, or take cash. But I didn't know if it's because I used my bank card that maybe they are attaching it that way as having an second source. And I was like, well, that's not, you know, I wouldn't think it was legal because I never signed anything saying I'm willing to pay if she doesn't pay. So I just didn't know if maybe that's why they did that or how they even got my, you know, uh -huh. information. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not entirely for sure about that. I just know that you need to make sure that you're monitoring your credit. If you do see a late payment there, you have a right to challenge that information. And I think that you have a great story there that uh, could appeal to the credit agencies to get them to delete uh, any late payments if one exists or to get Lowe's to do that for you. It's good, a goodwill gesture. Yeah. Good luck to you, Ron. I want to wrap with uh, Lee Kendrick by asking you about something. This wouldn't even have occurred to me, but I understand that a home equity loan of credit can actually ruin your credit score? It, it sure can. I mean, uh, obviously, if you're making your payments on time, it's still beneficial. But, uh, uh, you know, perfect example is a lot of people, whenever they'll go get a, a home loan, they'll get like a 100% home loan or a 95% of the value of their uh, home. They'll put down 0% to 5% and they'll have a first mortgage and a second mortgage. And often that second mortgage is structured so that you're not having to pay PMI. And that second mortgage will often end up being a home equity loan or you're just going out and getting a home equity loan later on. But typically what happens is whenever you get that first home equity line draw, so you closed on that home loan, and you got a $50,000 home equity line. And then your first draw is also $50,000. A home equity line actually reports as a revolving account, and that's the way credit cards report as well because they're also revolving account. A revolving account 
just means that you have the ability to, to lower your balance as well as to increase your balance because you can always go back and write yourself some more checks uh, to take advances. And because of that, and since it reports as a revolving account, whenever it's showing up nearly maxed out in the very beginning, it can tank your credit scores um, just like uh, it, it's crazy. I've actually seen credit scores go down as much as close to 200 points just because somebody had a maxed out home equity line of credit on their credit report. That's pretty remarkable. Uh, we've learned a lot tonight, uh, Lee, and I appreciate it. I think our, our, our uh, knowledge scores have all gone up considerably, and we much appreciate you being on. Well, hey, I really appreciate you having me on here as well. You know, we're really trying to start a movement out there and giving people better access to credit information and also uh, better access to being able to automate uh, their journey to better credit. Well, thank you very much again. Lee Kendrick, credit expert, founder of CreditUturn.com. We'll be back with more on the Jim Bohannon Show in just a moment. <laughs> 